Ugh, sweet Timmy nipple sauce. Okay, I feel like we knew what was mostly going to happen at Apple's October keynote, and yet there is still so much to talk about. So let's not waste any time and get straight through to the main part of the event, the new fully redesigned Apple Silicon MacBook Pro. Okay, I'll talk about the actual chips in a minute, but I just need to spend some time talking about the new form factor of these machines because I think these things look... Mm. This marks the first substantial redesign since, well, the 2016 MacBook Pro, which in the eyes of many, certainly my own, was a regression. And I think that Apple admitted as much today by backtracking on nearly everything that those laptops had set out to do namely eliminate ports and introduce the touch bar. That's right, instead of four Thunderbolt 3 ports, we now have three Thunderbolt 4 ports. Now, Thunderbolt version 3 and 4 are very similar, but they are indeed different. Now, both share a Type-C connector and have a throughput of 40 gigabits per second. However, Thunderbolt 4 strictly requires PCIe bandwidth to be doubled to 32 gigabits per second. Good for, say, eGPUs. Maybe not on Apple Silicon, but anyway. It also requires two 4K displays to be supported at 60 Hertz instead of just one, as Thunderbolt 3 required. Now, it's also worth noting that Thunderbolt 4 is backwards compatible with USB 4, but that they're not the same. It's all, well, it's all kind of confusing, but I'm not gonna get hung up on one single port because, well, some of our favorites from the MacBook Pros of yore have returned, namely HDMI. Though, sadly, it seems to not be HDMI 2.1 as it only supports 4K at 60 Hertz. There's also SDXC, which is still ubiquitous today, but a bit awkward considering that SD Express is on its way and four times faster than the outgoing SD. Now, with that said, most pro cameras have moved away from SD as primary storage like years ago. And that hasn't really diminished the handiness of having a built-in SD card reader, even if it's uh, kind of used more occasionally than it used to be before. Last, we have the return of Her Majesty the Queen MagSafe. Now, it appears to be the skinniest MagSafe connector yet, but it's functionally pretty much the same as MagSafe from ancient times, status LED and all. Really, the only difference, and it's an excellent one, I might add, is that it's just a USB-C connector on the other end. It's not permanently attached to a charger. So you can plug it into fancy aftermarket gallium nitride chargers that rock a smaller footprint than Apple's, especially smaller than that monstrous new 140 watt power supply for the 16 inch MacBook Pro models. Oh, and yes, you still can suck power over any of the remaining three USB-C ports using PD charging, so that's nice. Now, fast charging has also arrived, and you can now charge to 50% in just 30 minutes, which I think is great. And now we get to the touch bar, or <laughs> the lack thereof, finally. Look, I know lots of you guys liked the touch bar, and if you did, I'm, I'm sorry. Suck it up, because <laughs> we now have a full height function row, which to my knowledge is the first for an Apple laptop ever, and holy smokes, it looks glorious. Now, sadly, the arrow cluster still stinks. They're those half heights, but what do you do? Other than that, it looks great. The all black keyboard I've seen has been a little controversial on Twitter, but I think it looks awesome. And the entire design gives me major mid 2000s Apple vibes with the squared top, the rounded bottom, and those chunky feet. I love the look of these things. Now the next and kind of surprisingly, maybe one of the most massive updates is the screen, which has jumped to a variable high frame rate mini LED. It excuse me, excuse me, a liquid retina XDR with ProMotion. <laughs> now the pixel density has increased to 254 PPI, which is greater than both the outgoing MacBook Pro and even the 6K Pro Display XDR. More important than resolution, however, is the 10,000 mini LED backlights that allow for far better zoned lighting control, higher contrast ratios, and substantially higher brightness levels. We've seen this on the iPad Pro. 
Now, the old 16-inch MacBook Pro, that thing topped out at 500 nits, and the new displays on these new laptops can push 1,000 nits sustained full screen, which is amazing, with 1,600 nits peak brightness. That is going to make a colossal difference for pros working in HDR workflows. Now, also, ProMotion, it's going to make a difference because unlike a lot of PC competition, it's not fixed at a given frame rate. It's variable, just like the new iPhone. So if you're mastering for a 24 frames per second export, you can view content at its native target, which is amazing. As for regular plebs, well, it'll just make for very smooth cursoring around. And well, oh, I guess there's Apple Arcade. So you can play. Doodle Jump or Crossy Road or whatever games they have at 120 frames per second. <laughs> okay, I have avoided it long enough. It is time to talk about the notch. It's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, like sure, putting it in the menu bar, it's the most scrupulous area to hide such an eyesore and it's, it's not likely to interfere with content. Though menu bar icons can get really crowded on smaller laptop displays like the 14 inch. So I presume that there are software contingencies in place for those edge cases, but I guess we'll find out. Maybe the menu bar becomes horizontally scrollable? I don't know. Also, what if you change display scaling? Uh, does the size of that menu bar get smaller or larger than the notch? That would be kind of ugly. Look, I guess what really matters is that the bezels are the same dimensions on the top and the sides, which provides a more cohesive look. Uh, they weren't previously. And they've also rounded out the tops of the display corners, which I think is a nice touch, considering that it doesn't interfere with any of the content, because again, that's where your menu bar resides. As for the bottom corners, those are left squared. And that's great because that's where content actually is. So yeah, look, um, I don't know. There's so much new about these laptops that I'm not going to dwell on the notch, but just let's do it. Just close your eyes really quickly, okay? Close them. For, for real, close them. Okay, now open them. <laughs> this looks like a freaking image you'd find on the onion, admit it. Unfortunately, this notch, well, uh, you know, it doesn't include face ID, which kind of sucks. I really wish it did, but it does house an improved 1080p front facing camera. Sadly, that new camera doesn't seem to have the center stage feature, which was found on the iPads. And I think that's a really awesome software feature, especially for people that will be doing a bunch of presumably conference calls on these things. <sighs> okay, last small thing, and that's audio. Apple mentioned in passing that the headphone jack now supports high impedance headphones, which are very common in professional sound applications. And I'm really interested to see what that actually means because it could potentially mean it's a replacement for cheaper desktop headphone amps and audio interfaces, which would be awesome. Doubtful, but awesome. So we'll see. Additionally, there is a new speaker system with six drivers. There are two tweeters and then four opposed woofers, which seem to be passively radiated. Now, MacBook Pro laptops have always sounded amongst the best in the industry, the best in their class, and it's more than likely that these new systems will sound even better than their predecessors. With that said, this line, I mean... You get a theater-like experience. Okay, dude, cool your jets. They're laptop speakers. All in all, the design feels really cohesive and almost perfectly complete. But your new MacBook Pro isn't complete without Luminar, an app from today's sponsor, Skylum Software. Now, if you don't know about Luminar AI, it is an insanely easy way to drastically modify images with just a few clicks, like replacing the sky and spatial reflections automatically, or adding a light flare through a window that affects the entire image. It's almost spooky how powerful it is, but apparently that wasn't enough because even though Luminar AI is amazing, Skylum has announced the new Luminar Neo coming this winter. It has a completely new engine with features like AI masking so that you don't have to do things by hand. It supports layers. The Relight AI permits independent adjustment of foreground and background lighting, super cool. And then the background removal AI does, well, just that. It removes objects with a click. 
Now, Luminar Neo isn't quite available yet, but you can pre-order it today for both macOS and Windows at a discounted rate. And you can even bundle it with a discounted version of Luminar AI to start modifying your images today. It is a one-time purchase, there is no subscriptions, and there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So for pros and amateur photographers alike, you've gotta check out Luminar, it's genuinely amazing. The link is down below. Okay, time for the good stuff, the actual silicon. Now, in a surprise to, I think, almost everyone, we did not get the M1X nor M2. We got the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, which, hot take, those are actually great names because they're more easily understood and they match the iPhone naming convention. I know a lot of people don't like them, but haters come at me. I think they're good. <laughs> also, not to put a damper on anything that was announced, but, uh, well, the new chips, they're exactly what I reported and postulated on back in June. A 10-core CPU and a 32-core GPU in a single package with a shared memory pool dubbed Jade C Die. That is the M1 Max. And then there's the Jade C Chop that I reported on. That, well, is dubbed as such because it literally chops off half of those GPU cores. That's the M1 Pro. Except there was a slightly unexpected surprise. Two, in fact. The two lowest end configurations on the 14 inch MacBook Pro offer a 14 core GPU instead of a 16 core. And they also, in the case of the very, very base model, offer only an eight core CPU instead of a 10 core CPU. This almost certainly comes down to binning, wherein chips that have manufacturing defects, well, they just get a few of their cores disabled and sold at a lower cost in lower end machines. This is common practice in the entire industry and almost certainly what is happening here. Apple isn't setting out to make a low end M1 Pro. It's the byproduct of dealing with the realities of, of IC fabrication. Okay, so let's now talk about what these chips are actually going to be capable of. Well, frankly, we have no idea <laughs> because Apple's keynote charts are awful and they can go take a long walk off of a short dock. One thing that we do know, well, apparently they're fast. Fast two times faster, faster, two times faster, and seven times faster, even faster, again. two and a half times faster, is over three times faster. Faster, faster, it's faster, it's faster, 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 super, super, super fast, faster now. Faster, 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 faster than ever, faster, 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 faster. Now, some were quick to point out, hey, 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 be nice. This time they're now naming the laptops that they're comparing against. And uh, yeah, that's true, but, but in what? Relative performance in what applications, under what conditions? Oh, wow, the M1 Pro and M1 Max have more than 150 uh, performance units? Oh, that's incredible. Look, really the only thing that this demonstrates is something we pretty much already know. Apple Silicon is incredibly efficient relative to its power consumption. We also see that the M1 Pro and M1 Max's 10-core CPU rocks about a 30-watt TDP, which makes sense given that we know the M1 CPU is about 12 watts. Now, are there laptop chips out there that are more powerful than the M1 Pro and M1 Max? It's quite possible, likely even, given that the comparison Apple used was for an Intel 11th Gen i7-11800H. No slouch, but there are better. And Apple only ever stated that M1 Pro and M1 Max have higher performance at every power level, not period. However, one can successfully argue, and Apple did, that performance per watt is significantly more important in a laptop than total compute power. Heat, fan noise, and battery tend to matter more. Now onto the GPU, Apple shows that the M1 Pro's 16 core graphics cores push about a 25 to 30 watt TDP. And consequently, the M1 Max's 32 cores are pushing against 60 watts. Now, look, I suspect that there are very few scenarios in which the CPU and GPU in the M1 Max will be at full tilt, pegged at 100% simultaneously. But if they are, that pushes the chip's TDP to around 90 watts, which is similar to the combined TDP of the outgoing 2019 16-inch i9 MacBook Pro with the Radeon D GPU. Now, again, M1 Max is going to be a lot more efficient a lot more of the time. But these are going to be bigger, hotter, more fan-hungry chips than I think a lot of people think. And 
good. <laughs> I am glad that Apple isn't emaciating their chips in the name of silence or thinness. I don't want 2016 to happen all over again, and I don't think that they have. Now, back to the GPU. Apple gives higher relative performance to the M1 Max over something like the Razer Blade 15 Advanced, a 3080D GPU computer that's fairly thermally constrained. However, they also show, and frankly, good for Apple, that it loses out to a properly cooled 3080 and an MSI GE76 Raider. Now, there's so many questions like, what was the test and what graphics APIs were used, under what environments and conditions and in what app suites. Look, we've already wasted too much time with this stupid nonsense, but one thing we do know is this. The M1 Pro and M1 Max are the most performant chips in their power envelope, period, using battery power and it's not even close. Now, we'll do some real head-to-head -head testing next week against the outgoing 16-inch MacBook Pro a top-of-the-line PC laptop, our $10,000 Mac Pro, and an even higher-end Threadripper PC. So be sure to get subscribed and enable notifications. One last side note. The M1 Pro and M1 Max have onboard media engines, kind of similar to what Intel's QuickSync offered for H.265 video encoding. However, Apple's chips take it a step further. Not only is their hardware accelerated support for H.264, H.265 slash HEVC for both encoding and decoding, but there's also now a dedicated ProRes encode and decode engine. Now, the M1 Max doubles the number of hardware accelerators and is capable of playing back 24K ProRes streams or seven 8K ProRes 422 streams. Now, if you're not familiar with this type of video workload and NLEs and video handling, that is like insanity. It's more powerful than the 2019 Mac Pro's dedicated Afterburner FPGA card that's specifically designed for ProRes hardware acceleration. And that card for the Mac Pro costs the same price as the new base model MacBook Pro rocking that uh, you know base model uh, M1 Pro. Freaking amazing. Now we get to price. No, these computers are not cheap. And yes, the price has increased marginally. However, considering the number of improvements that they have brought year over year, I mean, look, a significantly faster silicon chip, a class leading mini LED variable high refresh rate display, improved speakers and microphones and a camera that doesn't totally suck, a better keyboard, real IO, faster PCIe SSDs, MagSafe, and more. This is not only the best upgrade to MacBook Pro in, I don't know, well over a decade, but it might be the most fairly priced MacBook Pro ever. I have drained my wallet, my financial stability is out the window, and I, that was louder than I expected. <laughs> and I have done it to bring you the best MacBook Pro coverage on YouTube. I've got three different models coming in, uh, two 14s and a 16, or I don't remember. But anyway, I also have the new AirPods, yay. So be sure to get subscribed, enable notifications, and before I part, I shall leave you with one more fun fact. Okay, so you know how the M1 Max is that Jade C die that I showed you earlier? Well, the upcoming Mac Pro is supposed to have literally four of those glued together. Jade 4C die. One freaking mega chip. Oh, the future sounds fun. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.